you to see everybody out tonight. I hope you'll be Bible through along with us. We want to really finish up what we started this morning, which is really, when I first started this year, I thought about things that are new for the Christian. And the first lesson dealt with a, a new gift that God has given to the world and sending a son to die for us, which led to the new hope, which led to a new purpose in living. And we talked about the idea of a new fellowship we have because of Christ dying for us and we enter the body of Christ and then also of a new standard of living, a standard different than what the world has. We had a lesson about the uh, new image as far as how we are to uh, present ourselves to the world and finally the new self-image, how we look at ourselves. And so this morning we talked about the idea of, of this idea of the new the new victory, new uh, freedom we have, and that's victory over sin. And in this morning's lesson, I made the point that sin is what causes us to be lost, and therefore it makes us an enemy of God and separates from Him. And that in order to be separate, in order to be free from that, we had to have something free us. And so God sent His Son to die for us so that we can have the freedom of sin so in order to serve God and have all these other blessings talked about. But we'll talk about also this idea of, of understanding what that really means. Because a lot of people, when you talk about freedom in Christ, a lot of times when we talk about God's grace that God had extended to mankind and saying so that son to die for us, you know, they had different concepts of what that really means. And so first of all, this is freedom in Christ is a discipline freedom. And that is some people, when they hear the word freedom, they think, okay, that means I'm able to do whatever I want to do. That, that means that uh, there's no restraint put on me whatsoever, and therefore I can, again, whatever my heart desires, I can get involved in. And sometimes you'll find people that, that talk about that in, in the sense of, I mean, sometimes the celebrities, that you know whose lifestyle is wrong, and yet they turn around and talk about Jesus, about God, and how they love God, but then they think they can go out there and sin, and it's okay. And we just have to keep in mind that freedom is not equal, that idea of a license to sin. And Paul makes that point in Romans 6 chapter, which we'll read in a few minutes here. But in particular, that there's some that were actually saying about Paul, that he's talking about God's grace and Christ, and therefore, you know, we just need to go out there and sin more. Because the more we sin, the more grace we receive, and that's just all good, right? And sometimes, in fact, today, people would tell you something on the idea that, well, you know, you talk about freedom, uh, your law, you talk about the Bible, you talk about the commandments of God. But I believe in God's grace. I believe God gives us freedom to choose whatever it is we want. Now, that's just freedom to choose. But that doesn't mean every choice is equal. It doesn't mean He's pleased with all of our choices whenever we make those bad choices. And so when they look at this idea of freedom, and they start talking about the Bible, what it says about the thou shalt not and the things we're to do, that a lot of times people start. You know, the automatically goes this idea, oh, you're being legalistic. Uh, you're being like the hypocrites, you're being like the Pharisees and the Bible. And again, I believe in God's grace. I believe God just gives us freedom and He wants us to be happy. And, and basically, that's how they view it. And uh, so we have to keep in mind that law and freedom are not, you know, they don't contradict each other. In fact, they work together in a sense that because we have laws, it enables us to do things. The very fact we are here tonight. And we got here safely, and it's partly because we have laws of how to drive on the road. Now, it doesn't matter what it'd be like if we did not have any laws about our roads at all. I could choose to drive however fast I want to. I could choose whichever side of the road I want to drive on. I can choose uh, whether to have to make turn signals or not. I can make all these choices. And if everybody had that ability to say, uh, Forget the, the, the speed limit. Forget all these other laws about the road. I don't drive whatever I want to. Then you know what? It'd be dangerous out there. But without, because we have laws to restrict us and tell us how to drive safely, we can get here safely. And so look at the Bible. We find that God tells us of how he wants us to live in freedom. And so true freedom never gives us the you know, power to do whatever we want to do. Now again, that sometimes people today they don't understand that. You start talking about okay, you are not to do this, and they say, I thought you were talking about freedom. But this idea of do your own thing, as said up here, is a misleading statement. 
There's never been a time when God's told me, and even in the garden, even God did not kill Adam and Eve. I put you in this, this perfect environment, and you can do whatever you want to. Don't worry about it. He never said that. And, and deal with the Gentiles, deal with the law of Moses. There's never a time that God just simply said, do whatever your heart desires to do, and I'm okay with that. Okay? He's never said that. And so we have to understand that we are not given unlimited power to whatever we want to do. When we obey Christ, when we enter into his body. And this gives us the point then, as far as understanding, the blessings of freedom in Christ involves some things. And one thing it involves is the necessity of God. Now again, imagine what would happen on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached, and, and that day it says 3,000 people were baptized, added to the body of Christ. And if there had been no more instructions, give it to the church at all. And if that was it, simply here's what you need to do to have your sins washed with blood, blood of Christ, and that's all that then how would we know really how to live? We wouldn't have to have a lot of Moses anymore. That's been done away with, right? But we really wouldn't know that either, will we, unless we were told that. But just think about this here, that, it, that basically, if we were not told, if we did not have the other sermons and the other writings that we call the Bible, the epistles that tell us how to live our life, we would be really in a, a position of, of not having any guidance. The very fact we have those things because God wants us to know. Now again, think about this. If you, for instance, with your children, would not tell them what you expect of them, but would then punish them when they disobey your will. Would that be fair? Would that be okay? I think we understand. That would not be fair. God wants us to know what he wants to do. And so you look over in Jeremiah 10, verse 23, and it just points out here that it says, the Lord... The Lord, I know that people's lives are not for us, not for them to direct their, own, their, own, their steps. That God, and through Jeremiah, this truth that God never had again just simply said, you decide what you want to do and I'm okay with it. You go have a, a vote on it. No, he says, I'm going to tell you what to do. Don't listen to your heart about this. Listen to what my words are. But the second thing is, this requires then divine revelation. Now again, if we have the Bible, but there are a lot of different groups that believe, okay, we can kind of decide for ourselves. We'll have some kind of convention. We'll take a vote on this here. And I'll ask you what you think about this subject. And I'll ask this person here what we think about that subject. And eventually we'll come up with a consensus. That'll be our doctrine. That's what we have today in the Roots world, world around us, right? But look here, that God did not simply say, if you decide, you vote, and you can have your own doctrine. What he says is, but he gives us the scripture. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. All scripture given is God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and praying in righteousness. That is so the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The reason we have the Bible is that God says, here's the roadmap, here's what you need to be doing, and you know what? You need to study that. You need to, have, you need to go by that roadmap. But then the third thing about this is that. If you look at the Bible and you think about what God's saying is that this leads to the idea of a properly trained conscience theory. Conscience. Our conscience. That idea of what we should be doing, what's right or wrong. Always thinking about then finding Nemo and Dory and talking about, are you my conscience? And that's kind of how people sometimes view things. Well, where does my conscience tell me to do? Well, their conscience can be good or bad. It can be either your aid or it can be your detriment because a conscience can be trained to do evil. It's, it's raised the wrong conscience. If it doesn't have the word of God, first of all, then it can be trained to do bad things. And there are a lot of people that do bad things and they have a pure conscience about it. Doesn't mean they're right. But it means here. 1 Timothy 1, verse 5 through 7. That Paul said, The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith. You notice all these things wrapped in together. How you have to have all these things, how they work together for this. But he says, Some had departed. Some who? Some Christians here. He's, talking, he's writing to Christians. Some had departed from these, had turned to me and me much talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they're talking about. Or what they so firmly, uh, uh, confidently affirm. They're teaching you to do bad things, they're telling you to do things contrary to the Word of God. And he said, 
You stay, what's your responsibility? Basically, stay away from it. Well, first Timothy 4, verse 1 and 2, he says, the Spirit, and of course, he says, in the latter times, some will abandon the faith. Now, again, the abandoned faith means you had to have had it. It means you had to, and he's talking about Christians. They had to obey the faith at one time, but what? We're following the seeing spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings done, not, not true, as hypocritical liars whose conscience have been seared as with a hot iron. And there are people that know they're teaching a false doctrine. But they're doing this here so as to have crowds following after them, or the police, other people are, are made to gain money for various reasons. And so our conscience has to be framed by the Word of God. First of all, if we're going to let our conscience be God's God has the right framing. And we have to do what God's Word says. I like the, the phrase here Christianity makes a man free to do what's right, it gives us the ability to do what's right. Without Christ, we're not going to be pleasing to God. Not only that, but also, we're under the benefits or control of Christ. Because he's going to tell us what to do. What did Paul say in Galatians 2 chapter? In verse 20, let's kind of throw this verse here in as a bonus verse. That Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me in the life which I now in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The very first part of that, though I have crucified myself, put to death what I want to do, and I don't do what Christ has to do. So we have to be willing to let Christ be the guy in our lives. And then not only that, but also, we have to understand there's a value to discipline. Of doing what we are supposed to be doing. Of actually fulfilling what God says to do. This is where the living comes in as far as God is teaching us. Uh, the Apostle Paul uses the illustrations of athletics in various writings and, and being a soldier and competing in, and over in 1 Corinthians 9 24 through 27 how many times do you know uh, maybe an athlete that wins but get, then gets disqualified and the reason they're disqualified is because they broke the rules and possibly Paul and that's being kind of universal after all if you can compete in whatever sport you want but you can make up your own rules then again, you're going to have chaos, right? You're right not going to have the sport. And so he says this here. Do you not know that, that in the race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. You, know, you don't want to be disqualified. You want to finish the course. You want to receive what, what's at the end of this life. That's good. Everyone who competes in the game goes to a strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. How I many people give up everything almost to receive this medal? Lindsey Bond, a number of years ago, one of the great down skiers of uh, this country's history in down skiing racing. That I remember her when she won her medal, she said, I gave up everything to receive this. And I thought, how sad. But she gave up everything, and she meant that. And he said, but we are receiving some that's everyone asking. Well, and therefore, I do not run like one, someone running aimlessly. I don't go out there and just kind of jog around and halfway ball again. I run, I, I do not fight like a boxer being in the air. You know, I strike the bone of my body and make it my slave that, so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. I'm going to tell you what God says to do, but you know what? I'm doing what God says to do. I'm going to discipline my body to make it follow God and do what's right. And so we can follow the half loose resistance, which they see here that's kind of like makes crooked people and crooked rivers. Or we can do what God said. It creates discipline. It takes discipline to do what the Bible says. But then the second, third thing about this is to give the freedom as a treasure. And that's we need to value it. We need to understand how precious this treasure is. When people talk about the 4th of July, like I said, this morning we had a celebration of July 4th. And that brings to mind the fact that those who sacrificed many times in order for us to get that freedom. And those who have sacrificed their lives since that time. I get upset when people talk about kneeling, you know, when the flag is around or kneeling their national anthem and and part of that is, is I know, uh, I've known people who have lost sons and daughters 
and wars and well, a fellow brother a, a preacher they lost the son of Af Afghanistan and there's a picture he used to post every anniversary of their son's death and the picture is the casket out had apparently just come off the airplane and had the flag over the coffin and there's his mama Drake over that coffin and he realized that was precious blood that was shit but we can have the rights we have now and when we think about the precious blood that Christ is for us and we need to understand how precious that freedom is and treasure that and so any against uh, freedom, spiritual freedom must be cherished and protected. We must value what Christ did for us. We must protect that. And sometimes people obey the gospel, but then they don't really value it. They don't protect it. And the Bible warns us about those who would go back into the world. And the reason it says that is because there are people that will go back in the world. They, they know what Christ did for them. They obey the gospel for them. For whatever reason, they go back. And Peter describes it like this in 2 Peter 2, verse 20 to 22. Is that if they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and overcome, that they get back involved in it, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have no way of righteousness than to have known it and then to turn their backs on the sacred commando passed on to them. Uh, the other proverbs are true. A dog returns to the bottom and a sound is lost, returns to all your mind. Or what in the mud. And so here's kind of the depiction here showing us how bad it is. And you know, I also think that the idea of the problem is all going back to his own vomit is about as disgusting as you can get. I have a picture here. They uh, Peter painted for us. And yeah, so we need to treasure that that freedom we have protected. that we need to protect some number of things. One is we need to be strong in the Lord and being able to resist uh, Satan. We mentioned this morning that Satan is our answer. He is the devil. He is a, a, like a roaring lion seeing one son of the devour. And the Bible just points out his influence is everywhere around us. And we need to realize that we live in a world where there's always spiritual battle going on. I think part of this blessed revelation is that we are seeing a spiritual battle even today uh, between good and bad. And Paul, when he talks about this battle, Describes it using a Roman soldier. And describes it here in the past, I know we're all very familiar with. And that is Jesus 6 or 10 through 18. And, and part of the reason he used it probably is that everybody was very familiar with this here. The Roman soldier was basically the best foot soldier in the world at that time. And so he said, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, not yourself, but in God. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes, or some translation says the scheme, uh, wilds of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So you read that here and just think about it. He's saying, we have all these things trying to confront us, trying to overtake us. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the Somehow I've got a missed part of verse there, but it says, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around the waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fixed with the thinner with the readiness to come for the gospel of peace. Put on the put on the armor, in other words. And this all this take the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows that you want. Take the helm of salvation and sword of spirit which is the word of God. Now some more times it says, you take on this, you do this, so to be able to withstand the devil. And then by saying, then pray the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert to always keep on praying for all over the people. He said, folks, you need to have on this armor. You need to put it on, you need to keep it on. You need to wear it all the time. Because you know, we have all these things against us, how the world around us. And so we just have to keep that in mind. And the fact that we need to be fitted properly. But also, we must guard against all teachers. Okay, that is, there are people in the first century, just yesterday, that go around teaching things that just weren't true. 
And again, religious times there, they had the Judaizers. You had those involved in idolatry. And Colossians 2 January 16 to 23 says, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you what you eat or drink, or with regard to uh, religious festival or new this, celebration, or Sabbath day. These are things that are going on, connect to a lot of those people's of these. They said, These are shadow things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights false humility and the worship of angels will qualify you. Again, there's some religious appearance here that they're all involved in. So this person also goes in great detail about what they have seen. They I put them with idle notions by their the spiritual men. And maybe they tell you I've had a dream or I had a uh, vision or, or God spoke to me and told me to do this. Tell me, tell me, and teach you. They have lost connection with the head and known body. And the whole body is supported and held together by his ligaments and his sinews, throws of God, <coughs> causes and throws. They separate themselves, in other words, from Christ. And says, since you have died of Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why is though you still belong to the world and you submit to his rules? Why are you listening to them? Why are you paying attention to what everybody else just says? How many times do you have somebody say, have you ever seen this new book? And uh, maybe uh, a number of years ago, it said, what, the Da Vinci Code? That was really big. And other times, the gospel, Barnabas, and other type of ideas people bring out there. Why are you listening to those? He says, do not handle such rules as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules which you have to do with things are de uh, destined to perish for use are based on mere human commandments and teaching. <coughs> such regulations indeed have an appearance of religious wisdom. They may sound religious, they may sound good, but it's self self-post worship. They're false feeling, they're harsh uh, freedom of the body, but they lack any value in restraining such uh, essential indulgence. They're useless. They're worthless. In fact, they're worse than that. That is, they're leading you astray. So we have to keep in mind that false teachers are out there. We have to need to have our Bible with us so to see what the Bible says go to do what it says. And so we need to be on our guard against them. But then also our freedom calls for gratitude and living according to God's word. The way we live our lives on a daily basis. That really is where the burden we throw, isn't it? How we live on a daily basis, what I do each day. And as we obey the gospel, as we read our Bibles, as we discipline our bodies, as we try to live by our conscience, by what the Word of God says, we need to be growing in our ability to live a Christian life. In order to do what God actually says to do, to be above sin. And these things are, again, sometimes people say, well, you talk about sin, but I believe in God's grace. Again, kind of going back to that Romans 6 chapter, because apparently some are saying that Paul was saying, falsely accusing him of saying, it's okay to sin because you now have God's grace. And so the response to that is, by no means. We are those who have died of sin. How can we live any longer in it? How can we keep on sinning if we have died to it? We, we separate ourselves from this. And so as Christians, we have to understand, I'm supposed to live with Christ. And therefore, that means I need to be unselfish in my love and service to God. I need to be loving towards how I treat my bread. You know, a lot of the writings in the New Testament really dealt with the idea of trying to get Christians to get along with each other. Trying to tell them how they need to treat each other. And it's not talking about necessarily false doctrine, it, although it does that, so to get away from those who teach false doctrine. But an example of Romans 14 chapter, you had this debate about the eating of meat and service of days. And, and Paul says here in Romans 14, verse 1, except one's faith is weak and without quarreling over this beautiful matters. Now he's not saying it's okay to have false teaching. But he's saying there are some friends that are weak and they couldn't put away the doctrinal parts of the law of Moses. They still want to observe that. And others who wanted to, you know, who had to, just somebody thought about the religious idols they were around and they associated certain things with those idols that those weak friends, they said, you know, Deal with those. Uh, understand who, where they come from. And then, as you go on down to Romans 14, chapter 10 through 13, he says, You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we all stand for God's judgment seat as written, as sure as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before the very meaning, every tongue will acknowledge God. So then each of us will give an account of yourselves to God. Therefore, let us not pass the judgment on one another. 
And see, so make up your mind not to put it in any similar block or obstacle in the way of brother or sister. And that last part in particular, what Paul's trying to get to, and that is, this brother has a problem, leave him alone. It doesn't affect what you're doing. You're not being brought into sin with him. Whatever way he's doing, it's not sin the way. But he said, you, you just kind of, you, you, you try to serve with love towards one another. You try to get along with one another. And then finally, I'm concerned about those still in bondage to sin. Uh, those who never obeyed the gospel, our, our neighbors around us, our friends, our relatives around us, we need to be concerned about their souls. And Paul mentioned this here in Romans uh, 9, 9 chapter 1 to 3, when he says, I speak the truth in Christ, I'm not lying, my conscience confirms it through the Holy Human Spirit. I have great sorrow and a new ceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish I myself were a curse and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those wrong race. He looked at his brethren that weren't accepting gospel and said, I wish I could do something to bring Christ. I wish, I, I, I would pay the penalty if I could. Now, of course, that was impossible. But we need to have the same attitude about those who are lost today, about concerned about their souls. And the freedom, the, 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 and that's part of, again, of living in gratitude and what God's supposed to do. Now, I serve to him. So these are the things about freedom. I just want to kind of conclude this uh, series lesson on. As I was looking at this, I thought about the song, Me and Bobby McGee. And I, I looked at that, that, that one line that stands out in particular where it says, freedom is just another word for nothing left to lose. I looked at that, what does that mean really? And they had this study oh, about the song. It's written by a man by the name of Chris Christopherson. Uh, Chris and this man, um, Many of you know, the songwriter, actor, singer. But early in his life, he was a Rhodes Scholar. Also, he went to West Point. He was in the military as a helicopter pilot. I believe his dad was a general, by the way. Married, had a family, and totally walked away from all of it. Just left everything. Died on army, left his wife, left his children. Everything is gone. And as I thought about that, I thought this is really kind of a very sad life. A freedom is simply no word for nothing else to lose. And really, I think he got it wrong. And that freedom is the ability. Freedom of sin gives us the ability to serve God. It gives us the ability to live righteously. It gives us the ability to be comfortable <coughs> in fact of uh, our home in heaven. That's what freedom is that God intends us to have. And so the last passage here, 1 Peter 1 verse 5, it says, Who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to reveal in the last time. We are free. To look forward to the life of heaven with God. I appreciate your kind attention this evening. Let's go ahead and open our song books to the song selected. And if anybody this evening needs to confess Jesus Christ, Son of God, repent of sin, be baptized for remission of sins, we're here to aid you. But also, I said this morning, we're here to pray for one another if you need those prayers. Once less, let's stand as we sing.